Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Partial funding provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Thank you for joining us here on another episode of Market Journal. I'm Brian Stuskin. The holidays are a special time of year. I hope you've had a chance to relax and reflect on 2022. Now that we are just hours away from the new year, our team has been compiling some of our favorite stories of the past year. First, it's a robot that can save a lot of lives. Purdue University reported last spring that there were at least 29 grain entrapment cases documented in 2021. While that number represents a solid decrease from the peak of 40 cases back in 2011, a pair of UNL graduates are seeking to bring that number down to zero. Market Journal's Mike Straub gives us a closer look at a device that couldn't make that a reality. It's called the Grain Weevil. Grain bins may look safe from the outside, but if you've ever had to climb inside one, you know that they can pose a dangerous risk. In 2019, the Daily Yonder reported that grain entrapments rose 27%, with deaths rising by 53% the same year. Realizing that lives are at risk, two young Nebraskans formed a partnership which will help keep people out of grain bins altogether. So actually we were approached by our farmer friend who, uh, who saw us, you know, kind of tinkering around with robots and asked us one day, he said, you know, I never want to climb into a grain bin again, and I have some kids that I know that one day might have to climb into a grain bin. I never want them to have to go through that. So I want you guys to build me a robot so that no one ever has to go through that process ever again. The Grain Weevil robot is a grain bin safety and management robot. It scurries across the top of the grain using auger-based propulsion, and this allows us to manipulate the grain so we can break up clumps and bridges, level the bin, um, and help with the e efficient extraction of the grain when you're taking it out. The two recent engineering graduates designed the robot to be small and streamlined, ensuring it can move freely within the grain bins. Our small 18 inch by 20 inch robot allows us to be mobile inside of the bin. Um, unlike other solutions, which are big, heavy, attached to every bin, um, expensive products, we're able to move from bin to bin. We're able to do more complex tasks, um, like breaking up specific clumps or fixing small areas inside of a bin. So we started kind of with a lot of off the shelf uh, devices. So we, we hit the ground running with that. And then slowly I've been transitioning over to our own proprietary software. So it's been about a, a year long process to get that all shifted over. So right now we're able to do temperature as well as ambient humidity. Um, we're working towards some more grain quality measurements, um, but those are more complex. And so we'll be working through those this summer. Um, so right now we have a remote control that we just drive manually, but in the future we hope to have it be completely autonomous. The farmer only has to drop the, the robot into the bin and then just walk away and let it run. Other future changes include more data sampling options as well as cameras, so farmers can keep an eye on what's happening inside the bin. Both Zane and Ben are optimistic about the grain weevil's future as they can see technological changes happening within the industry. We're pushing as fast as we can. We're really passionate to get this thing out there as quickly as possible to help the farmers. So in the future, hopefully in the next 10 years, we see every farm as having some sort of grain bin management system on it, and we hope to be that system. So we hope that the grain bin, the grain weevil is on grain bins all across the United States and hopefully eventually internationally. I think that grain bins and farming in general is becoming more tech advanced. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of, a big push on the safety. Um, as well as the management side, because we, we can improve the storage process that we currently have. Um, and I think that there's going to be tools that will help and aid the farmer in that process. And I think that we have something that can definitely help that process. And what we always say is, farmers know a lot about what's going on inside of their bin. They have sensors, they have the ability to learn, I have a hot spot, I have something going on, but n now we're creating something that can safely do something about those problems. The grain weevil is going into testing at five farms across the nation. Ben and Zane hope that these tests can help fine tune the robot to work faster and more efficiently in the future. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Mike Straub. Thank you for that story, Mike. The grain weevil team continues to showcase their product to the public. At this year's Nebraska Ag Expo just a few weeks ago, that team was featured in the Innovation Hub. 
The University of Nebraska-Lincoln has held several human lectures at both UNL's East Campus and on Innovation Campus. The purpose of this lecture series is to engage in discussions that focus on providing security in the areas of food, natural resources, and renewable energy for citizens of the world. Earlier this year, several NASA delegates were on hand to discuss how NASA satellites and science serve to support food and water security. Market Journal's Bill Dodd caught up with a team during one of their tours. The Hearman Lecture Series focuses on providing security. That means global security in the areas of food, natural resources, and renewable energy for people. And that all starts with securing the sustainability of rural communities where the vital work of producing food and renewable energy occurs. The latest installment of the lecture series focuses on the utilization of data gathered from NASA satellites and science to support food and water security here on Earth. Yeah, several groups on campus have been users of NASA data uh, for decades now, you know, myself included for 25 plus years, uh, particularly in regards to monitoring drought, but also looking at agricultural landscapes, ecosystems, and the influence of climate and climate change on these landscapes is pretty critical. So NASA data, it's big data. It can go from a really fine resolution to a really coarse resolution, so we can cover a lot of scales. And uh, it, it, comes into ha it comes real handy, not just for research applications, but also for operational applications like the U.S. Drought Monitor, which is the weekly map that we host here at uh, the National Drought Mitigation Center at the university. So that's one potential uh, use. The other way, if you flip it around though, is that uh, you know the university, the research farms, the producers, we all have the ability, this is a living laboratory here where we can actually validate and ground truth the NASA data and models. Does it match reality on the ground? These are important linkages I think that we can offer up back to NASA. So it's definitely a two-way street. Well, I was uh, an assistant professor. Keynote speaker of the event, Dr. Karen St. Germain is the director of NASA's Earth Science Division. However, before entering her role at NASA, she was a faculty member here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. The experiences she had at UNL gave her a unique perspective when it came to the challenges that she's facing in her current position. My faculty position at the University of Nebraska was my first job out of graduate school. I grew up in the Northeast. So my years here in, in Lincoln, and, uh, and I did travel a bit around the state and the region, that, that was my first time seeing this kind of landscape, this kind of agriculture. Um, and. And I've been thinking about this problem of bringing remote sensing and that unique vantage point of space to food security and agriculture ever since those days. And it's just a thrill that, to be able to get back here and meet with people and discuss uh, a, a path forward together. Nice to meet you. During their visit to Lincoln, the Earth Science team was able to tour local agricultural operations as well as get a firsthand look at the research happening here at UNL. When it comes to transforming hard data into real-world applications, developing working relationships with university researchers is an incredibly valuable asset. Well, NASA is a science agency and a data agency. And uh, we use our scientific understanding of the Earth as a system and the data we collect from our, uh, our assets in space to support a whole range of applications, and agriculture is one of the most important of those. It's really important to get feedback from the people who are trying to use our data and information. It's, uh, you know, we, we, we do a lot of work to try to make, uh, to translate data into actionable information, but it's really only by talking with people who are trying to use that information that we learn where did we get it right, where did we not get it right, and where do we need to do more research, maybe to solve uh, a problem we didn't even know we had. You know, there's, there's a wealth of technical expertise at the University of Nebraska and, and universities around the country, and no one is closer to the producers in those states than the, the people at the universities who are, are doing the research. So we like to work with extension programs, universities, regional uh, facilities, to take the work that we do at a global level and, and help us make it most impactful at, at the local level. Thanks so much, Brad. The only thing I would... Uh... While the latest Yearman lecture is an informative insight into how NASA data is collected, analyzed, and transformed into real-world applications, 
There is one take-home message Dr. St. Germain hopes sticks with the viewers and attendees. Similar topic. I would like the big take home message to be that NASA has a lot of uh, information, data, uh, and, and research and applications that we think could be useful to uh, producers in Nebraska and around the country. And, uh, and we'd like to, to share that information and the, that insight, but also get the feedback on what they really need so that as we're building the, the satellites and the sensors that will we'll launch toward the end of this decade that we're actually building the right things. As Mother Nature continues to change and evolve, producers and researchers must follow suit. As long as our producers, universities, and government agencies can continue to collaborate, future technologies stemming from today's research will be out of this world. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks for that story, Bill. If you'd like to review this or any of the past Hearman lectures, they're available online. As always, we've included a link to that series page along with this story on the Market Journal website. In a state where cattle outnumber people, it's not common to stumble upon a bison ranch, but our team did just that earlier this year. We visited Nebraska Bison to get an idea of what it takes to make this operation a feasible enterprise. In rural Lancaster County, a group of bison graze the grass at Miller Bison. The farm in Nebraska is one of the locations where the family operation raises bison for meat, and it all started more than 20 years ago. We got our first bison in 1995. My dad brought some home um, from the Custer sale at that time, and I've been around bison my whole life. That was when I was in high school, and uh, grew to like the animal, it's different. Um, family's been involved in cattle for many generations and the bison was something different and it just naturally grew um, through in the family and with us liking the animal. For their diet, BJ says bison can be fed very similarly to cattle. Most of our stuff is on grass for the vast majority of its life. Like these guys will be on grass their whole lives. That's, that's the purpose of them here with the cow-calf herd. Um, but they are, they're similar to cattle in their uh, feeding and body types that uh, they're fed very similar things. While they may be similar in some ways, there are some major differences. Most notably, their size. There are some major differences being mostly they're wild animals. Um, you know, uh, the, some of the things that come along with bison that are, that can be detrimental to starting a bison herd is the facilities, the size of the fences, the, the loadouts and things like that. You know, just dealing with this animal, um, being as, as they are still a wild animal, um, can be definitely more difficult, but something that once you have the facilities and stuff that, that we do pretty well with. Another difference? the rate of gain. BJ says it can take up to three years for bison to be ready to process. And uh, they're, they're slower as far as gains. Um, when you're feeding them, trying to turn them into a finished product, a lot of times it takes close to three years to feed an animal. Um, the, the length of time to get them to the finish, they don't gain very fast. Um, and the, the, the time involved to keep that animal healthy happy and going until he can be processed. Even to have a first baby is always generally a three year deal. Once the bison reach a finished weight, some of those animals are processed and sold under the brand Nebraska Bison. BJ's sister, Megan Olesiak, manages that operation. So Nebraska Bison is a family owned company that sells uh, bison, elk, and grass fed beef online. Um, we're pretty much strictly e-commerce and we raise the bison and ship from, or ship straight to your doorstep. Megan says that the bison are processed at a USDA inspected facility in Colorado, then shipped to a customer's doorstep. So our top selling product on NebraskaBison.com is bison, of course. Uh, we have a very large selection of cuts, um, steaks, sausages, um, summer sausage, uh, all the prime cuts, burger, of course. 
uh, jerky. And then we also sell 100% organic grass-fed beef as well as uh, so some elk products as well. Uh, we recently added some dog bones, bison dog bones also, and we're kind of expanding that market into dog treats and a few things like that. Megan tells me that their customers choose bison for two primary reasons, the health benefits and the taste. People just, you know, are referred from their doctors, um, the health benefits. It's basically compares, or bison meat compares most directly to a skinless chicken breast in health benefits. Uh, so you just can't beat it. Plus you have the rich flavor, you know, and of course uh, shopping local and ranch raised and that sort of thing is um, typically on the top of uh, most consumers list as well. Back to the production side of business, BJ says Nebraska is a natural home for bison. Growing bison in Nebraska, I think it's a great place to grow bison in Nebraska. Um, it's right in the middle of their what would have been their natural habitat and range. Um, the weather's great for it, the grasses are good, everything works well in Nebraska for it. When you're firing up the barbecue over the remainder of the summer months, beef, pork, and chicken may be at the forefront of most grill masters' minds. However, bison may be something you're curious to try. And if that is the case, it never hurts to buy from a trusted local source like this. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the products offered in Nebraska bison, you're encouraged to visit their website. It is simply nebraskabison.com. I can confirm that their bison jerky is delicious. Well, in a typical year, more than 42 million people flock to the city of Las Vegas each year. Tourism, obviously the bread and butter for the area, and it's generally uh, brings in about $60 billion. Those visitors are often anxious for a great dining experience, and that's where Nebraska steps in. Earlier this year, Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts sent well, some ag leaders visited the entertainment capital of the world to learn how Nebraska beef is being served up. The Bee Promotion Tour kicked off at the Wynn Resort and Casino. Attendees of the trip received a behind-the-scenes glimpse of the massive resort, which includes 4,700 rooms and suites, 32 restaurants, and much more. We're here in Las Vegas talking with places like the Wynn to say, hey, world-class restaurants deserve world-class beef. And so it's an, ability, it's an opportunity for us to be able to bring in producers from Nebraska, talk to the folks here about how we raise uh, our beef in Nebraska, why it's the best in the world, and just work with some of the folks who are involved in the industry here so that we can give them some of the tools to be able to talk to their customers about why they should buy Nebraska beef. The Wynn Resort serves up tons of beef. 460 tons of beef each year, to be exact. After that tour, some of the chefs had the opportunity to meet with Nebraska beef producers to learn where that steak began. Nebraska Department of Agriculture Director Steve Wellman said the discussion helps build spokespeople for Nebraska beef. Who better than the people in the, in the, in the kitchen, for the chefs, and then their team and the weight team that, that interface with the customers all the time. And I think, uh, you know, we've invited them, the chefs, to Nebraska if they want to come back uh, to visit us in person and visit our ranches. We'll, we'll surely do that with these folks and, and help. Uh, we talked about how they meet daily or quite often with their wait staff and talk about the products that they're putting on the plates. And we're going to make that connection back to Nebraska on those beef uh, items. It's from Omaha Packing Company to regional meat distributors such as Newport Meat of Nevada. On the second day of the tour, the group visited that business, which is a division of Cisco. Newport Meat will often order beef and further process it into specific cuts for high-end restaurants and resorts. Jocelyn Mango is the sales manager for the company. She says it is important to continue the passion that was put into raising that animal. We basically continue the story and the passion of what that happens in the ags and in the middle of America. We want to continue those um, standards that they took to make sure that that quality came to us to be able to produce those steaks for those chefs. Um, basically, it's important that we kind of push that passion and what we do because that chef is going to be that last person that puts it on that plate. So we really want to make sure that what your guys' work that's getting done in Nebraska is actually going to be shown and how highlighted perfectly here in Las Vegas or any of those other cities that our product goes to. The beef producers who were on that tour agreed the trip was a worthy investment of time to make connections and share the story of Nebraska beef. I'm one bookend 
of the beef industry, and this is the, the other book in. And it is so important for all of the segments, uh, all the books in between, to uh, to come together and understand the whole process throughout this 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 very segmented industry. People are demanding the quality product that comes out of Nebraska, and that I think we've all learned um, through this is that Nebraska is best positioned uh, for high quality beef. Um, from the conception of the live calf in, in a cow-calf operation, all the way through the feedlots to the beef packers such as Greater, Greater Omaha, uh, Nebraska's best positioned for, than anywhere in the country uh, for, for the beef industry. The idea of a domestic beef promotion tour spurred out of restrictions on international travel due to the coronavirus pandemic. Governor Ricketts said he was pleased by the interactions the group had while in Las Vegas. By bringing in our producers that can talk directly about what they do, it really helps the folks here in Las Vegas understand where that beef comes from so they can tell their customers. So that's probably the most valuable part of this trip. A personal thank you to that group for inviting me to join them on that trade mission. As we shared with you a few weeks ago, Greater Omaha Packing Company is gearing up for a big expansion. If you missed that story, you can view it online at our YouTube channel. Well, of course, it's winter right now, but before you know it, it'll be time to begin to fire up that planter. Earlier this year, market journal producer Bill Dodd caught up with Dave Panko, owner and operator of Panko Ag Solutions, to get his advice on making sure your planter maintenance is up to snuff. Having your planter in top condition is important for many producers. This is particularly true for producers utilizing reduced and no-till operations. In short, a well-maintained planter will give seeds their best chance to flourish throughout the growing season. A majority of the physical responsibilities for pushing soil, placing seed, and getting things off on the right foot rests squarely on the shoulders of the planter. Making sure this piece of equipment is in top working order will give you the best possible start for achieving maximum yield performance. Really for, for any row crop farmer, in my opinion, the planter is their most valuable piece of equipment. The biggest impact on any crop is largely determined by the planter and the performance of that planter. We need to have seeds placed accurately and provide an even emergence of that crop um, to, to gain the, the highest yield. Keeping proper maintenance on your planter is, is probably very, very undervalued. Um, in my opinion, growers need to take the time to understand what proper maintenance is on each component of their planter. Uh, out in, in front of the row unit itself, you're going to have your row cleaner that's going to clear out any residue or root ball that you have in the way or dirt um, to provide a clean surface for, for the planter row unit behind it. So then behind that you have a true V disc that's going to form a furrow for that seed to drop in and the depth of that true V disc is going to be determined by a gauge wheel that, that that is right next to those discs. And up above, at the same time when this furrow is forming, you're gonna have a meter that is singulating and dropping the seed as accurate as possible. And that seed is falling down through a seed tube and placed in the bottom of, of the, the seed trench. And behind that, and you can be, as some guys, if they choose to do so, um, would, would drop fertilizer in the seed trench. And then behind that, you would have some sort of, of closing wheel or closing system that's going to close that, that seed trench up. With so much happening in one fell swoop, it's easy to understand why proper maintenance is so crucial to your operation. One of the first thing your planter does is clear debris and move soil with the row cleaners. This will be a good place to start, as you may run into problems including yield loss without proper maintenance of this component. Most likely you're going to either clean too much or not enough residue or dirt ahead of your row unit, which is going to cause uneven emergence or possibly leave seeds on top of the ground and you would cause um, basically a loss in yield potential. For most row cleaners, you're going to have a linkage or an, an arm for a floating row cleaner that is 
and you need to check that linkage as well as the bearings that on the wheels themselves. Um, those need to be um, serviced um, every year and if you do have a fixed row cleaner you also want to check those bearings on, on those wheels as well and make sure that, that they are, are properly maintenance. There are many options available to producers when it comes to applying down force or down pressure during the planting process. Too much or too little, and you could wind up costing yourself over the long haul. However, there are some extra measures you can take to ensure that doesn't become an issue. And to set down force correctly, we need to have clarity on what the row unit is doing itself. I mean, there's sensors we can mount on the row unit that will tell you if there is a smooth ride and if that row unit is staying on the ground at all times. Those, those sensors can be placed and you can have those readings um, in the monitor. Secondly, we can put a, a weight pin on the row that will tell us the amount of weight we're pushing down on the row. Typically, when a, a grower is planting, if he is applying more than 450 pounds of pressure on that row, you're going to be causing compaction. Farm machinery is an investment. As such, you'll want to achieve the best return possible on that investment. Failing to get a proper start in the best possible seed bed, crops will ultimately be challenged from the onset to grow to their full potential. With proper maintenance and some fine tuning, your planter should get your growing season started on the right foot. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks again for that story, Bill. Some great information. If you're looking for some tips on getting ready for the upcoming planting season, if you need to do something during an upcoming snow day, you don't need to look any further than the CropWatch art website. It is cropwatch.unl.edu. That is all the time we have for this week's broadcast. Before we go, a sincere thank you to you, our viewers, for joining us on this program each week. It is a privilege that we do not take lightly. We look forward to bringing you some new and relevant content as we enter into 2023. Until then, I'm Bryce Tuskett, wishing you a safe and enjoyable new year. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Partial funding provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.